Hey, friends, you're watching Behind the Scenes Divine Intimacy Radio. Of course, uh, this is Dan Burke, and I am not with Stephanie Burke. Stephanie is in uh, leading a retreat in Bosnia, Herzegovina, and uh, with a bunch of holy women. And um, so I'm going to be solo today, but uh, I have a very exciting guest. Exciting, I don't know if that's the right word. Someone that I have a great deal of respect and affection for um in in many ways because of we are um her, our heritage where we both come from suffers some similar um persecution historically in the ch in the world and in the church and her name is simone riscala and we're going to be talking about the phylos project so uh something i think you all need to know about and and i'd really like to get the word out about all of her work simone is one of those people who uh, once you get to know her, if, if she has something she wants to talk about, it, I, you know, generally speaking, my my default is yes, everybody should listen. So we'll talk with her in just a moment. And before we do, though, as folks are getting signed in and and ready for the conversation, uh, I want to tell you about uh, Divine Intimacy and Marriage Retreat. August 2nd through the 4th, Providence, Rhode Island. We're also going to have one just for in Trinidad, Tobago uh, this year. So anyway, if guys, if you are suffering a severe deficit in points, and guys know what that is. That's a secret guy thing. If your points inventory is low and you want to reset, your wife will love this retreat. But you will too. I, I've never had a, I've even had a non-Christian, um, even though it's a thoroughly Catholic retreat, just because of the humor and, and all of that really uh, say that they enjoyed it. But it's uh, it's for um, spouses or pre-marrieds. It's for uh, marriages in trouble, marriages doing well. Believe it or not, it's, it's, it's really a powerful retreat. So go to spiritualdirection.com forward slash events spiritualdirection.com forward slash events and you can find all of our events the you will not find the trinidad tobago listing there yet but it'll it'll be up soon so check that out subscribe to spiritualdirection.com you'll get you know of course uh, notifications about these sorts of things courses at the avila institute like a new one called my soul magnifies the lord mary model of contemplation taught by marianne siegmund and a uh, great new course anyway you know our goal in all of this, the reason we tell you this before every show and sometimes in the middle, sometimes at the end, is we want to provide you with as many opportunities to grow spiritually as possible. Because if you become holy, you change and the world changes around you, and that's how we heal the church. So let's go ahead and jump into the show. And I guess I have to say both parts of the, of the intro. Um, so I'll see if I could do that. Okay, on your mark, let me turn on the timer here. On your mark, oh, well, we'll see how well this timer works. I think my phone is going to, okay, let's see. We have a new studio set up, uh, so we're working all these things out now. On your mark, get set, go. This is Dan Burke. Welcome to Divine Intimacy Radio, your radio haven of rest. Stephanie would usually say your hermitage of the heart, and I would say uh, your monastery of the mind where we lift our hearts and minds to heaven to draw upon the wisdom of the saints, the teaching of the church, so that we might understand how to navigate the tumult of this crazy life that we all live. And today we are talking about um, a, I don't know, what I would call a holy remedy, a remedy born out of the um, the goodness uh, of, of the hearts of people, I believe, who pray, who have the best interest of the church and the world um, at, at hand and, and are really looking to, to make a difference. It's what happens when you love Jesus, the, the normal outgrowth of um, your life uh, is that you love God, but in, in the epistles of John, it says that uh, I, if I could summarize the epistles of John in in one very important theme, I would say it would be, as you are with men, so you are with God. And 
and and if and if you're not caring caring about others and you're not caring about those created in the image of God of course our priorities are those who are um in the in the flock or in the fold but Jesus even said we need to leave the 99 to save the one so if we're not caring about others then there's something broken in our relationship with God and so why this is why we cover a topic like this on divine intimacy radio which is a little unusual but it is it is fitting to do so and today i have one of my favorite humans on the planet simone riscala with us from the philos project simone is the deputy director of education at the philos project a first generation american egyptian or american of egyptian armenian descent Simone has a particular interest in matters of religious freedom and culture and the Eastern roots of the faith. She's a faculty member at the Avalon Institute, just because God loves us, and host of a new podcast, Beyond Rome, which seeks to reconnect Catholics to their Hebra Hebraic and Christian roots in the Near East. And you can find her talks and publications and podcasts at her website, culturalgypsy.com. That's culturalgypsy dot com welcome simone it's great to have you on the pod on the, on the broadcast thank you dan and you're one of my favorite humans and i'm not just saying that i'm so honored to be here with you today well i was you know obviously you and stephanie struck up a relationship first and then i got to know you and your good work when you were over at endow and uh stephanie just thinks the world of you as well so it's great to have you and to talk about this new project what is Philos, why, why should people care about it? Ah, uh, thanks so much. The Philos project is a very, very interesting. Now I wait. So before you go, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it wrong, right? It's, it's well, people say, people say Philos, but I, I say Philos. I think most people say Philos, okay, but I, great. I've heard it said both times. Both I'll, ways. I'll try to correct yeah. my, go ahead. I'm sorry. Philos from the Greek for friendship. There you go. Uh, yeah, I mean it, and the name Philos kind of refers to you know Abraham being called the the friend of God, mm. and so the the what Philos is dedicated to is positive Christian engagement in the Near East, mm -hmm. and the method being that we we approach it kind of like you were saying in your intro so brilliantly that a friend of God and a, and a friend of others, mm -hmm. and that is how we're going to really make lasting impact in the church and in the world, and particularly as Christians who have an attachment to the Near East, precisely because Christianity began in the Near East, began in Israel and the Near East. Yeah, I, you know, um, I always like to say, when we're talking about lo uh, uh, evangelism, love built a bridge over which truth can pass. And love isn't about, you know, using your turn signal or holding the door open or not kicking puppies. It's about implicating yourself in the lives of others and the needs of others. Uh, I, I, remember, I remember Archbishop Shapu once preached a homily, and he said, if you don't serve the poor, you're going to hell. <laughs> I, thought, I love that bishop. Um, but it's, it's sort of like that, right? I mean, if we truly love Jesus, it's, it's, it's impossible, in, in my opinion. If you have a healthy love for Jesus, it is impossible to be blind to the needs of those to others, in particular, the what we would call the Anawim or the little ones, you know. And I think you and I have joined forces to deal with the Anawim in terms of the Armenians, yes. uh, and Anawim in terms of the, the size of, you know, the remnants in their own country, the first Catholic country in the world, if I remember correctly. Yep. Um, yeah. Grateful yeah. to you for that, Dan. That oh. prayer for Armenia last last year, right before the uh, cleansing of of the Nagorno Karabakh, we had that prayer vigil, and it it really meant a lot to me that the Avila community came together for that. So thank you. Well, God be praised. So the 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 Philos project is to draw the hearts and minds of faithful Catholics to the challenges of the Near East. Would you say or the uh, so the Philos Project is actually not Catholic. It is Christian, no, yeah. but Philos Catholic, which is a, a special project within the Philos Project, is Catholic. So right. 
So we're talking about a special project within the, the broader Philos project, which has a lot of projects, which I can, I can go into if you want. I can go into to all of it. But the Philos, the Philos Catholic special project within the Philos project is dedicated to engaging Catholics to be more in touch with their Hebraic roots and with the Near East in particular. Yeah, I, I received an invitation from you all to go to Israel, which yes. I was, which I was, you know, ready to jump on just because you've told me about the Philos project, and I thought, well, if she's, you know, doing this, it's going to be good. But unfortunately, uh, we we had something hard scheduled. But I, uh, if you keep me up to date on when it's, well, you know, well, why do you? You'll you'll definitely be reinvited until it works out because it's yeah, an incredible trip. Now tell folks about that trip. What 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 would I have seen? Why? What's the goal of of taking people on these uh, kinds Absolutely. of? Absolutely. Well, there's like the the broader goal of, of of Christians in the United States and also of Catholics who are all always Christians that we have lost touch with our Hebraic roots and we mm -hmm. have lost touch with an understanding of our Eastern Christian brothers and sisters. That is something that, of course, John Paul II was very much committed to. And he that famous phrase from his encyclical Ut Unum Sint, right, to, that the church to be healthy and, and the church is suffering needs to breathe with both her lungs, both the mm. Eastern lung and the Western lung. And we often forget that sometimes, especially in the West, which, you know, you talk about poverty and, and reaching out to the little ones in the United States, we're the ones that are spiritually poor. And that's, that's something that Mother Teresa noted when she came to the United States. She said she's been to a lot of poor countries, but the poorest country she'd ever been to is America because we suffer from the poverty of loneliness. Mm. That kind of spiritual and cultural loss and depravity because of materialism, rising secularism, sometimes we kind of lose touch with, with authentic Christianity, with authentic Catholicism. And so being in touch with our brothers and sisters in the East is, is, is this kind of a revival of, oh, yeah, Christianity began here. Mm -hmm. ISC 11, spiritually, we are Semites, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's an experience and an authentic expression of Christianity that's easily lost in the West and in, in an American context sometimes. And we see these reductions all the time, Dan. Anybody who works in the apostolate, you see it. Yeah, I mean, I, I have been really blessed by more recent um, explorations by folks like Brant Petrie on yes. the Jewish roots of the Mass and yes. really reintroducing Catholics to this reality. But it's a sort of a side topic that I don't want to get us off on. But I, one of my frustrations with, I, I'm I'm thoroughly Catholic, and this is Jesus Church. Jesus is a Jew. It's it was you know it's established by a Jew, mm -hmm. by the Messiah of the Jews. It is his church. So I I don't question any of that. But for some reason, and the Lord allowed this actually, and and it I haven't come to any wise you know understanding of why. But the and and it's probably in part a judgment because. Though many Jews did embrace the faith in the first century, even many, as Scripture says, in leadership did. Some people think, you know, all of them rejected uh, Jesus, and they didn't. It, 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 it's just not the case. Um, but I think, in in way, maybe it maybe it's a judgment. The church, because of uh, early persecution, became very what I would call gentilized. Uh, Judaism and it and its history was almost um, faded, you know, in the background in a very Gentile not, or a non-Jewish perspective, however you want to use the phrase, became dominant in the way the faith was understood. And I think it's really important that the work of, of Brant Petrie and scholars yeah. who understand scripture and the Jewish roots of the faith, and uh, there are others, but also a project like this to help us to reconnect to to the reality because it, i think it just opens up the, your your heart and mind to a deeper more i don't know true or authentic understanding of who jesus is was um what is you know the jewish faith and how does it relate to catholicism and 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 maybe even enrich 
well, I, I'm not maybe, but enrich our own uh, view or understanding of, of even Catholicism and, and how it how it ought to be more deeply influenced by its its uh, past. Absolutely. I think one of the most fun things being a Catholic is, and I think the reason that I am a Catholic Christian is that the church's voice is prophetic. Mm-hmm. And it's, I don't think it's an accident. And, and I, I think I, as, as often as people will give me the opportunity to speak on this, I will. I don't think it's an accident that in 2023, the year that both Armenia and Israel were attacked by aggressors, that those that the, that the newest doctors of the church are both an Armenian doctor of the church, St. Gregory of Nautic mm-hmm. and St. Irenaeus of Lyon, mm-hmm. who, you know, is the, our most recent doctor of the church. And he is the guy, he is the guy that really fought the Marcion heresy that wanted to keep the Old Testament Judaism disconnected out of the Christian thing. And because St. Irenaeus is because of his work, we have the Old Testament scriptures that we decided that our this covenant was going to be a fulfillment, a continuation of God's work in salvation history. And so I just I these are the kind of things I take to prayer. What's what's the Holy Spirit up to? What's God up to that He's asking us through the Mother Church to look at St. Gregory, the Armenian monk, to look at St. Irenaeus, who's the doctor of unity that's supposed to unify the East and the West that's supposed to um, the word is recapitulate that Christ was going to gather all together. This is from Ephesians, which is what St. Irenaeus's great work against heresies was examining. So Dan, I, to me, that's something that is very, it's an invitation to me to prayer and to, to look at what is God up to behind the scenes when we're looking at our own life, our own mission, our own callings in light of what's happening in salvation history, which is, of course, connected also to world history. Very good. When we get back from the break, we'll continue our conversation with Simone Riscala. And I want to talk to you, Simone, just to get your brain ready about the 24 perpetual pilgrims and uh, talk a little bit about that effort that you have going on. We'll be right back. So 1336. So we need to go 12. It's usually 12, 30, and 13. 12, okay. Um, friends out there just uh, on the live stream, you know, I should probably say it when we come back in. I'll do that when I, we come back in. Is that okay to go to the Perpetual Pilgrims? What is the Perpetual Pilgrims? Oh, that's good. I'm glad I asked you. <laughs> it's, it's in the... Uh, well, that's good. It doesn't matter because it has nothing to do with you, I guess. It's in it's in the notes I was given. Um, what could you share with our audience about the 24 perpetual pilgrims who were selected? What's a typical day like in the life of a perpetual? Is it is nothing, it's nothing related to you guys? No, oh, good. So. Well, well, it's good. I mean, we're live streaming this, so the mistake is being aired, <laughs> but, um, but at least we're not putting it on the, the regular show. So that's the fun of watching the live stream. You get to see our mistakes and <laughs> that is whatever. Fun. Okay, great. So I don't know why. Okay, that's all right. So why don't we go t- to, well, I'll ask you this. Do you want to talk about why Philos hosted a conference on Nostra Tate, or do you, Or is there a topic you want to hit coming back in? Yeah, we can definitely talk about why we hosted a conference on Nostra Tate. I think that's... Great. I think that's important. Mm-hmm. Great. Okay. Very good. All righty. Let's go on your. So I am going to watch. We got 12 minutes in this segment. On your mark, get set. Go. This is Dan Burke. Welcome back to Divine Intimacy Radio. Stephanie is leading a uh, retreat for women in Europe and uh, happily so. And so I'm alone today, but not alone because I'm with Simone Riscala and we're talking about the Philos Project. And Simone, um, let's talk about the, the the conference that you hosted on Nostra Tate. Why why did you guys pick? I mean, I, I have I have a guess, but why did you guys pick Nostra Tate and and uh, tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Well, for those who are listening who don't know, Nostra Aetate is a a very short document from the Second Vatican Council. 
think it's the shortest of the 16 documents that came out of the Second Vatican Council on our relationship with non-Christian religions, particularly Jews and Muslims. And the reason that um, and this is a groundbreaking, a very important, significant groundbreaking document, highly controversial in the, in the Second Vatican Council. But the reason that the Philos Project and Philos Catholic was hosting this conference at Franciscan last October was because it was an anniversary of the five years of the Tree of Life synagogue mass shooting in Pittsburgh. Mm. And there had been very disturbing rising rates of anti-Semitism in the, in the world, in the country. And so it was a conference kind of dedicated to that. And so when the idea was proposed to Franciscan University of Steubenville, there was no hesitation on their part because they were aware of the rising rates of anti-Semitism, not just in the, in the world, in the West, but also in the church. Um, and so it seemed like it was something that we put together after the attacks, the Hamas attacks on October 7th, but the conference had been in works for months and just happened to be scheduled a couple weeks after the Hamas attacks mm. because everybody was asking us, well, how did you put this together so quickly? But it had been in the works for a while. So mm. it, was a, it was a very providential conference. Yeah, I mean, for those who don't know, Nostra Aetate, the original purpose of that document or the conversation was to mend uh, fences, if you will, between Catholics and Jews. Now, there's a lot of misinformation about the Catholic Church and Jews. The Catholic Church uh, um, protected uh, many, many Jews uh, in the Second World War, and there there were a lot of issues. Uh, I mean, the our martyrs th that this listeners of this show would know about, like. Um, St. Teresa Benedicta or, or Edith Stein was martyred because of Catholic resistance to what Hitler was doing. And so he said, OK, well, then, since you're going to resist, I'm going to kill more. I'm going to be more aggressive. It was a very, very difficult circumstance for the Catholic Church, of course, as a global entity in that context. And there's I think there's been a lot of criticism uh, regarding the, the Catholic Church's actions. Frankly, I think when you look at their record, what it truly is, uh, they did they did well, but in these kinds of circumstances, it was so brutal. There's there's no, I mean, there's very little upside to 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 any negotiations. It all had to be settled by bloodshed, unfortunately. But so Nostra Tatre was was to mend fences uh, because of perceptions, whether rooted in truth or no, um, of co of conflict between the Catholic Church and Jews, but then it then it was expanded to also ex address concerns from other uh, other faiths, which I think watered it down. I don't know what your perspective is. Yeah, that that was that was part of the controversy. I. Uh... <laughs> it's just a whole long story, but there is a free course that Philos Catholic saw, that Philos Catholic offers on Nostra Aetate um, that is definitely worth checking out through our online academy if you want to delve deeply into the history of Nostra Aetate and the historical context. And there are, you know, out, you know, out, outstanding exceptions of Catholic heroes during the Second World War and the Shoah, the Holocaust, um, but you know, anti -Semit Christian anti-Semitism has been a problem since the beginning. And what is stunning to, what is scandalizing to me is that it's been a problem from the beginning. What is, although it's very, I mean, there were a fallen world and a broken, broken church. Um, what is very faith building for me is that the church got to the point where she had the humility. And I think John Paul II just as a as a saint, as a pope, as as a Christian, really embodies that humility, where he's unafraid to apologize and to make reparation and to take us all with him and saying that we have contributed to this, we have given in to this spirit of anti-Semitism. And when we have, it has not been of the Christian spirit. Yeah. And we need to repair it and we need to grow in, and this is the beauty for me of of especially of the popes of the 20th century, that if it's true that 
the Jews are our elder brothers and sisters in the faith. Well, then we you love your family mm -hmm. and take them as part of our family. And so you mentioned Brent Petrie, who I, I've loved for over two decades now. Um, I was happy when 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 Bishop Barron reminded us of the of the exciting call to re-Judaize Catholicism. Love hearing Father Mike Schmidt talking about, you know, we're not a separate people. You know, we we look to the roots for hopes of greater fruitfulness. Mm -hmm. These are all authentic fruits of the Second Vatican Council, I would say, that we really need to lean into deeply, especially, especially now when in this last year, you know, anti-Semitic attacks have risen by 400 percent is the latest statistic. That it's I've, crazy. It's crazy. It is crazy. I wonder, do you have any sense of why? I mean, I, you know, when you look at the Armenian genocide, the the fundamental structure that preceded or that the fundamental social construct that caused the hatred is the same with the Jews as with the Armenians in my limited knowledge. Yeah. And that is they were merchants. They were sort of um, masters of the marketplace. They were good at that reality. So they tended to have more money, um, maybe then more power. And uh, but they weren't necessarily the majority in terms yeah. of the and so it just was an e they were an easy target to hate both groups yeah there's there's that there's other really good reasons that we can look at i think the heart of the reason however and you know i i love to go to kind of straight to the root the heart of things is that it is a, a, a true supernatural spiritual evil sure. the spirit of anti-semitism and I have to believe, and again, I'm thinking about this a lot, especially being Armenian, especially being a Catholic, 2023, what happened to Israel and Armenia, that if it's true that the Jews are God's chosen people, chosen for the sake of the whole, no doubt, but still his chosen people, that he still loves them, that that St. Paul is right in Romans 11, that the covenant is not revoked, that his favor still lands upon these people that there is going to be retaliation for that. Mm -hmm. So so too with the Armenians, who are the first Christian nation, as you mentioned, there's a certain retaliation from, from the enemy for that, also a particular chosenness. I would say that with the Armenians, it's a spirit of apathy, you know, uh, good men doing nothing. Mm -hmm. With anti-Semitism, it is this, this rising Jew hatred. And like you said, there are many, you know, maybe practical or, reasons for it but i think ultimately it's a spiritual evil and andrew doran our senior research fellow uh director of philos catholic as well he has a great article in mosaic magazine where he actually talks about my grandmother where a grocer told her um today the jews tomorrow you to her face and he discusses in that article which others have discussed and you know my library of books that i'm reading going through now dan that when there is a rise of secularism, there's a rise of paganism, and that spirit of paganism is really contrary to the true God. Mm. And so perhaps the more secular we become, the more pagan we become, uh, the more there is that um, fighting, if you will, on the level of the supernatural against the true God. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, you you took the part of what I, the one that I should have taken on this show because it's about the interior life. But you know, you're you're exactly right. At you know the the enemy hates God's people because because uh, God loves them and yeah. and they hate God. You know, and it is true that He chose a particular people in history yep. to bring the gospel. He chose a particular people to introduce Himself or to bring clarity about who he is and how to be in relationship with him. And he did choose the Jews to do that. And so there is a particular hatred. And of course, uh, the greatest hatred, I think probably uh, in, a, in a real tangible sense is for Jesus uh, and his bloodline, of course, mm -hmm. is Jewish, though he's fully God and fully man. The, so it, it makes perfect sense that there would be a deeper hatred of Jews than than uh, of Semitic people than yes. uh, 
than anyone else, um, though he hates everyone. He's an equal opportunity hater. You know, uh, yeah. he, he hates everyone because we're all created in the image of God, whether you have Jewish ancestry or or not. Every one of us uh, bears that image and he hates that image. And so yep. it's it's a weird thing to talk about in this culture. It's very countercultural very to weird. talk about this sort of, you know, there there was, but it is a historical fact, right? There was a people he chose. It, it, yes. And that, that that's definitely, it is weird, but like Flannery O'Connor says, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you odd. You know, <laughs> <laughs> there's a, I'm working my way Dan through, um, and you mentioned, um, sister Benedicta of the, of the cross, um, St. Edith Stein, you know, she was friends with Jacques and Raisa Maritan. She used to go to their Thomistic intellectual circle. Mm -hmm. Groups and I, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall, time traveling just to hear their conversations. But you know, Jacques Maritain, I'm making my way through his um, chapter on the mystery of Israel, and he wrote this incredible paragraph, which I'll read if you give me permission. Um, you know what? I'll tell you what, Simone. Yeah. We're going to do a second show, and because okay. we're out of time in this first show, but let's open in the second show with that. Okay. And we'll read we'll set that up again. So folks, thanks for being with us on Divine Intimacy Radio. Check out the Philos Project and Simone's work at culturalgypsy.com. And now I have to do Stephanie's outro. Until next time, may the God of peace make you perfect in holiness. May he preserve you whole and entire spirit, soul, and body, irreproachable at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're gonna cause our